just as a warning, I have really bad allergies, so if I sneeze or pass out in the middle of this, it's, it's okay, it's not the first time. Um, anyway, my name is Harley Litzelman. Uh, I'm a professional Latin dancer, and no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> I am 18 years old and I'm a lobbyist. Uh, so that probably sounds weird to you, and it should, because it is. It may even be disconcerting. I mean, what business does this teenager have influencing the legislators you all elected? But no fear, let me allay your concerns and promise you that even if I was uh, bribing legislators with hookers, cocaine, and suitcases full of money, <laughs> uh, which I'm not because, you know, budget cuts, um, <laughs> my, influence, my influence on the political process is woefully diminished by something much more innocent and forgiving. I'm a student. The, it's hard to imagine a case of the deprivation of civil rights more generally accepted than the disenfranchisement of the youth. I mean, you might ask, why can't kids vote? I mean, have you listened to any of them? I, they don't know anything. <laughs> but interestingly enough, that's not quite the case, because there are kids who do know things. And anyway, if knowing things was a voting requirement, the size of the American franchise would be reduced to the seating capacity of this building. <laughs> but, but, but it would include most of you in this building. Rather, the deprivation of civil rights according to age follows the basic logic that the youth have not yet accrued enough civic knowledge or developed the capacity to make an informed civic decision. But apparently it's only a matter of time that they will accrue this knowledge and will develop this capacity. But I'm not here to make any hasty appeal for a lower voting age, because that's a different discussion, and hell, I'm 18 and I'm not going back. So, I'm here to argue that we can no longer rely on the passage of time to prepare our youth for democracy. Because that's effectively what we're doing. We expect our youth to ripen into citizens, like fruit on a tree. And of course, I'm speaking of the virtue of citizenship, not the status. So you can probably infer from my argument that I don't think schools are playing the role they should in preparing their students for democracy. And you're right, but there's a little more to it. I think schools are actively stunting the civic growth of their students, because schools put students through a process in which their input is not valued. Therefore, the first and longest contact that any of us have with a public institution is one of obedience, tyranny, and fear, which I think is slightly less than ideal. But we have to be careful. <laughs> we have to be careful in how we seek to fix this situation, because we cannot, if we try to fix this with another top-down authoritarian mandate, as we have tried in the past, we will fail, as we have failed in the past. The spirit of reform must resemble the goal of reform. We need to democratize the education reform movement and engage with our students as valued constituents and our teachers as valued experts in education. But let's think about this. We don't, we don't acquire values from formal instruction, from me babbling to you, from textbooks. We acquire those values essential to the defense of what we value. So if we, it follows that if we want our students to value liberty, justice, equality, they need to have been raised to defend those values. This is a question of the school environment and the fertility of its soils for democracy. We need, to, we need to take responsibility for the psychological and sociological effect that the school environment has on its students, and we need to manipulate this effect to produce the result we want. And if the result we want is the complete preparation of our students, of our graduates for democracy, then civic responsibility needs to characterize every component of American education. This is a case for what I call student citizenship, the active engagement of students as valued constituents in educational planning. As a lobbyist for the Associated Students of UC Davis, my intimate connection with the student opinion and perspective informs my advocacy for students in Sacramento, but more importantly, my, my occupation of these spaces of political process and educational planning further prepares myself for these civic environments that I will one day steward. But let's think about the problem. We send kids to schools that are convinced that kids need changing, but are also convinced that kids can't change schools. No matter how involved you are in educational politics, or just the general conversation in education, we all know about the apparent crisis in American education. But when students move through the system, they, they are not engaged in this dynamic conversation. Rather, we send kids to schools that tell them where to sit, what to wear, when they can play, when they can work, what they can work on, what classes they need, which teachers can teach them, and of course, if, when, and how frequently they can go to the bathroom. <laughs> Does this sound like an environment conducive to a democratic upbringing? But you may say, hold on, let's be real. 
I mean, we trust and train administrators to develop rules and standards essential to a safe, functional learning environment. And that's true. We don't expect first graders to unionize. <laughs> but as I said before, the progress to adulthood requires some accrual of civic knowledge, some development of the capacity to make an informed civic decision. So you would expect some gradient of democracy according to the pace at which students are reasonably capable of practicing democracy and are reasonably capable of negotiating their rights within the classroom. That gradient doesn't exist. That discussion is not happening. And schools convince kids that there's no discussion to be had. Hey, you, get off your phone. What are you doing? Get down from there. Put your hand down. Get out your book. Turn to page 394. Where is your book? This isn't Woodshop. What are you doing? The dignity of our rights is in large part founded on our capacity to claim them. So the degree to which students are capable of liberty should largely determine how liberated they should be. And it should be the role of schools as breeding grounds of citizenship to challenge students with the responsibilities of liberty, justice, and self-direction because these are the virtues we will expect of them as adult citizens. But schools further dull any sense of citizenship because we have embarked on a new industrial revolution of sorts. A, a mission to industrialize the mind. Obeying a new millennial dogma of standardization and accountability to high-stakes testing, we have effectively locked out of our classrooms those components of learning essential to discovery, to inspiration and self-direction. But the argument for standards seems eh, noble enough, that if we just teach kids what they need to know, just to survive and get by, then they can go on and learn what they want and major in what they will and have the lives they choose. But when teachers, schools, and school districts are held accountable only to these metrics of student achievement, regardless of what students want to achieve, that becomes the only objective of school. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, man, where was I? <laughs> okay, so, student achievement. Yes, so that means teachers and schools cannot afford, for the sake of their own employment and survival, cannot afford students the liberty to discover, to fail, to be inspired, to be self-directed. And if students are not accustomed to a world that respects their rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then they will have no ownership of their importance. They may be taught in government class that these rights exist, but if they are not engaged in a learning environment that actively embraces these rights, then they will have no reason to defend them. So for what I'm talking about, it doesn't matter all that much which standards we use, or even which standardized tests. When students are held accountable only to these homogenous standards, irrespective of their interests, personalities, and, and circumstances, they are taught that those things don't matter to the people who do matter. That's the common denominator of the 13 years they spend in public education, and that's the impression that sticks. But let's think about what the solution might look like. If we empower students with the agency to solve problems in their education, I suspect they're going to come up with student-centered solutions. These solutions aren't going to transfer the public good of education to the private benefit. These solutions aren't going to alienate students with draconian zero-tolerance policies. These solutions aren't going to marginalize the arts or stigmatize failure. We're going to partner with our teachers as valued experts in education who need both our perspective and our support. We're going to engage with our communities. We're going to protect our environment. We're going to think differently, and it's going to make a difference. <laughs> it's... I've only been able to, it's really hard for me to think about what education would look like if we empowered students to the extent I suggest. So I call on all of you, as, in, as people with voices, as people in positions of influence, to join me in this effort to democratize education. But if you truly believe you are not in this position, if you, do not, if you are not as fortunate to have these, have these influence, to have this power, then as you enter roles of power and influence, whether as parents, teachers, administrators, policymakers, community leaders, do not forget what it was like to not be heard. Do not forget what it was like to, be, to have your concerns ignored. Because unless some serious work gets done, then our children will be in the same situation and will be just as oppressed as we were. 
So if we trust our students as inheritors of a tradition of democracy, as stewards of liberty and justice, if these virtues embolden every fiber of American education, from our curriculum to our instruction to our discipline and to our planning and reform, I guarantee that these are virtues our children will seek to uphold. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Joe. Step off with me to the side here. They're going to set up for the next one. Um, really, really important topic. Really important topic. Both of my parents are actually retired teachers. This is something that I think about constantly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to get your opinion. What do you, what do you think about uh, movements like charter schools that are looking to kind of challenge the existing paradigm of, oh. uh, you know, the way that public education works? So, would you like another 10-minute talk? Uh, <laughs> um, charter schools. Charter schools that you can't look at any one charter school and say, oh my god, this is the problem. Well, for some you can. But the movement towards charter schools represents a greater trend of privatization. As I said, transferring the public good of education to the private benefit. There are billions and billions of dollars in education that private companies want a piece of. And when we allow education to regulate according to market incentives rather than social and public incentives, then we have a major problem. Now, you, you mentioned this a little bit during, during your, your monologue. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges, it wasn't really a presentation. You did a great job, by the way. Um, that was amazing. I, I definitely cannot do that. Um, I have notes on the screen. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that you mentioned is this challenge of people really care about student issues while they're students. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you move on from being a student, and I can attest to this, you start working nine to five, you're working Monday through Friday, the issues of being a student suddenly don't seem as pressing. And you don't really revisit them until later on in life when maybe you have your own kids and they're going through school. Mm -hmm. um, what can people do? Why, why is it so important that people care so much about remaining in touch with that identity of being a student? Uh, we're gonna take care of you when you're old. <laughs> That's a good answer, That's a good answer. One of, uh, one of my favorite statistics, and I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase pretty horribly here. Um, very recently, a few years ago, um, there was a, a statistic that came out that was talking about how um, not only did we cross the 7 billion mark in terms of human population on the Earth, but we also had a very interesting shift in, in the largest demographic on Earth. And that's people who are largely our age, early 20s to 30s. Um, and what that represents in a democratic society is power. It's tremendous amounts of power. And we're talking about around the world. And so I really, really encourage you to listen to the message that Harley was saying, that I'm saying with him, don't forget what it's like to be a student. Don't forget the things that matter to you as a student. Don't forget the things that you wish you could have changed and do something about it. As you graduate, as you move on with your lives, do something about it. Listen to this guy. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. so much, Harley.